This lecture is being delivered as part of the Advanced Economics Unit at Charles Darwin University. I'm Matthew Nicol with a company called REMPLAN. It's the 1st of October 2012. Uh, this is the, uh, the second of the recorded uh, lectures. Now, I'd like to uh, recap on some of the material previously covered, but then I'd like to then uh, extend upon that and, uh, and, and look at uh, ways that we can apply the input-output framework to identifying uh, potential uh, opportunities for import replacement and evaluating in a local economy. Now, as we've pre previously uh, discussed, uh, um, REMPLAN is a, it's a regionalised input-output model. So we're, we're starting with, uh, with national data sets, national transactions tables and input-output data sets, but we're regionalising them to make them specific to, well, areas such as uh, the city of Darwin, uh, Alice Springs, and then the, uh, the Northern Territory overall. Now, the aim with this type of approach is to, it's to understand the structure of, of a local economy, and local is however we define it. So, so it could be defined by local government area boundaries or, or even smaller areas within an LGA, a local government area. But uh, it might be a slightly broader region, uh, which is defined by a combination of boundaries right up to uh, state and national levels. So, so we're aiming to generate uh, area-specific estimates of, well, of course, employment, uh, but also output wages, exports, and gross regional product. And we want our small region estimates of gross regional product at, for instance, all of the local government areas together. And, and we want that uh, to, in total, equal ABSs, or the Australian Bureau of Statistics, latest estimate of gross state product for the Northern Territory. We also want to be able to compare areas on a like-with-like -like basis. So what are the strengths of the Darwin economy relative to Alice Springs? Or we might look further afield. What are the relative strengths of Darwin vis-a-vis uh, -vis Perth or Adelaide or somewhere else in the country? And, and, and you know, that, that can be particularly relevant for uh, national and multinational companies that might be running operations across Australia or across the world, and they might be uh, seeking to make uh, an assessment about Darwin or Alice Springs as a suitable location for, uh, for, for placing some of their operations. It's not just about profiling a local economy, though. We, we really Input-output analysis lends itself particularly well to understanding an economy as, uh, as an interconnected system. So it's not just about the, uh, the output or the wages that are paid by a particular industry, but it's about how retail trade and manufacturing or construction relate to each other, and how perhaps an expansion in the construction sector, what likely indirect benefits is, uh, is that likely to have for other sectors in the economy? might be manufacturing or professional services, for instance. And look, all of this is providing that uh, that evidence based for that evidence base for economic development and uh, and planning decisions. Okay, so we're applying that combination of uh, ABS census data together with ABS national accounts data uh, to generate a whole raft of region specific. Uh, estimates on a local economy. So, so employment output, wages and salaries, regional exports, regional imports. So these aren't necessarily, or well, part of that are goods and services exported overseas or, or imported from overseas, but a regional export and a regional import also includes uh, sales and purchases of goods and services that are, that are, um, that are to or from outside of the boundaries of our local economy. And so if we define uh, our local economy as the, uh, as the city of Darwin, then it's basically uh, any sale of a good or service produced in Darwin that's sold somewhere else, and it might be to Alice Springs, that would be a regional export, even though it's not being sold out of the country. 
other measures include value added and gross regional product. Value added is the total output or gross revenue generated by an industry from which we subtract any of the intermediate goods and services used as inputs into that process, whether they're sourced locally or whether they're imported into the local economy from outside. And uh, value added by industry is the major component of gross regional product. Okay. So in terms of the national accounts, we're using, uh, we're using gross domestic product, but also at the state levels and territory levels, gross state product. And we're also applying the, uh, the national input output tables in the latest uh, for 2007 and 2008. And these are ABS's uh, its latest estimates of, of how the whole economy is structured and, and how different industries make proportionate contributions to the overall economy. Part of those tables, it's not just the total output that each industry generates, but it's also the, the total number of jobs associated with those activities. To that, we then apply uh, place of work employment uh, data from the census to understand how that economic activity by industry sector is uh, distributed uh, across the country. Now, there are a, a number of merits to that particular approach. It enables us to compare areas on a on a like with like uh, basis. But uh, just to just to reiterate on a point that was previously uh, made in, in in earlier lectures, now, we use place of work employment data for an area that is where on census night where people said that they worked, not necessarily where they were or where they reside, and so. I put that question to you then. So, so why don't we why don't we use place of usual residence or enumerated on census night? Just reflect on. And, and look, you might disagree with us, but but we're we're quite clear in our minds that that place of work employment data is absolutely the the way to go about this if you're trying to measure the size and characteristics of a local economy. By applying uh, place of work data, we cut through all of those complexities around uh, fly in, fly out, or in a large city such as you know, Brisbane or Sydney, people living in one area and, uh, and commuting somewhere else. Okay. So basically what we're doing though, to, to regionalise a model, where we're looking at the total output generated by an industry the total number of jobs associated with that sector, and we, we can then work out a coefficient between jobs and output. And then we look at the, uh, the employment profile for your area, and we apply those coefficients to estimate, well, given a certain number of jobs in a particular industry in your area, based on the latest national accounts data, we would estimate that those jobs would be generating output to a particular, uh, to a particular value. So there's a, an example of, uh, of the output that's being generated uh, by industries. Okay, so, so for a given level of, uh, of output, we then need to think, well, okay, that's creating demand for, according to the national accounts, that's creating demand for intermediate goods and services within the Australian economy. But because we're interested in a local economy as an interconnected system, we want to understand the degree to which uh, those goods and services are likely to be sourced locally. And so we need to think about, okay, what is a reasonable basis uh, for, for estimating that capacity of a local economy to supply goods and services? As we've covered in previous lectures, for, with the approach that we're applying, Employment data is the absolute key. It's the basis for estimating uh, the level of output that's being generated by industry in the local economy. It's also then the basis for estimating the demand that those activities are likely to generate for goods and services, those intermediate goods and services that are used uh, in production. 
let's just think about an example. Take a, uh, take a construction business. It wins a, a $40 million contract uh, to build, a, uh, to build a, an office facility. Just think about all of the material that that project, project is going to require from, uh, it could be um, concrete tilt panels, it could be uh, plate glass, all kinds of structural metal products. All of those inputs represent, they're all examples of uh, intermediate inputs into production. Now, we need some sort of basis for going, well, what is the capacity of, for instance, the Darwin economy to supply concrete tilt panels or plate glass for an office building or whatever it might be? And the approach that we apply is, once again, just to look at that uh, place of work employment data. If you have employment in sectors that typically produce concrete tilt panels or plate glass, then we will be estimating that there is some capacity in the local economy to supply those um, to, to supply a proportion of the goods and services uh, required. Now, with this particular um, approach, with this uh, input-output methodological framework, there are a whole raft of uh, assumptions that I think it's really important to be aware of. Regional performance matches national and state performance. What we mean by that is that coefficient between output and jobs is the same in Darwin as it is in Alice Springs. So therefore, our estimate of the amount of output that a worker generates in Darwin is the same as Alice Springs, whereas in actual fact, there may be some regional uh, variation. Another, another assumption that's important to be aware of is uh, homogeneity um, within an industry. And, and what I'm referring to uh, in relation to that is um, the ABS classifies a business or designates it to a particular industry based on its main activity or its main source of revenue. So you could have a wholesale trade business, for instance, that one year decides to set up uh, a retail operation as well. Now, for many years, uh, they're, they're, they're effectively operating in those two market spaces. That There's a wholesale side to the business and a retail trade side as well. And for many years, they continue to generate most of their income from the wholesale trade side of the business. And so year in, year out, they're classified as a wholesale trade business. Now, the year, if, there, if this is what happens, the year that they make $1 more from their retail trade activities, the ABS then classif classifies that business as, as, uh, as uh, under the banner of retail trade. So basically, a business can only be one thing, even though in actual fact, it might operate across a number of different uh, activities. When we model the impact of change, so we're building all of these uh, supply chain relationships uh, between industries, and so and so using that example of construction, we're going to go, okay, well, typically, for construction, for every $1 of output, it spends $0.05 cents on structural metal products based on local employment in structural metal product manufacturing. If the construction sector or a business within construction wins a new contract, we'll be estimating, okay, that's likely to generate some demand for those metal products. Now, the assumption is when we run uh, an impact model through uh, REMPLAN or a similar sort of uh, uh, input-output modelling framework, the assumption is that there are no um, capacity constraints. The assumption is yep, that structural metal products can gear up and service that additional demand. In reality, of course, there may be a number of supply constraints. There might be skill shortages. There might be limitations around uh, power supply, electricity or reticulated natural gas. 
There might be restrictions around in, in relation to planning issues. Maybe that business to service that contract would need, or that, that industry would need to expand. However, there's constraints around suitably zoned industrial land. So there are a whole range of things that might limit uh, the capacity of industries to realise those estimated op opportunities. Now, from the perspective of, uh, of planners and economic development people in government, I suppose that's their job, in a way, to look at what those constraints might be and to make... Uh, to apply strategies and actions that hopefully mitigate against against those uh, any potential constraints that are identified. Look, other other assumptions and limitations are that the uh, the ABS census uh, employment data is uh, is point in time. So of course, and this is a, a very timely issue because we're right at the end of the census cycle. So all of this data that, that, that you have access to via REMPLAN, it's all place of work data from the 2006 census. Um, now, we don't have too long to wait now. At the end of this month, 31st of October, uh, the ABS is scheduled to release all of the um, all of the 2011 industry data. So that will be a very important update uh, in relation to the work that uh, that we do, um, and, and and look, the other the other thing is, um, just as I suppose the ABS industry data is um, homogeneous in that it it only captures one activity, it's also true in terms of all of the employment data that um, that it only picks up a person's main job. And, and finally, in terms of assumptions, the model is saying, well, for instance, you have, uh, you have uh, a certain number of people working in construction, you have a certain number of people working in, for instance, uh, structural metal product manufacturing in the same area. The national accounts indicates that there are uh, buying and selling relationships between these sectors. Uh, in REMPLAN, we're saying, okay, if these complementary activities are co-located, we're assuming that there is in fact an economic relationship between the two. Whereas in reality, that structural metal product business there, possibly, it could be there exclusively to service, um, to service uh, clients loc located outside of the area. And the construction sector might be importing absolutely all of, all of those materials into the economy. So one of the, one of the assumptions in REM plan is that over time, uh, complementary industries and complementary businesses have co-located and that in fact, there are those um, economic relationships between them. So taking all of those assumptions on board, in terms of what REM plan is uh, attempting to do, in terms of estimating those uh, uh, understanding the uh, the area specific nature of the local economy, understanding the likely uh, interactions, the buying and selling relationships between industries, and all of this as a as a resource, as a tool for uh, economic development and planning. Then, I guess I'm putting the question to all of you: Do you think, given the assumptions that are being applied, that this is um, that this is a, re a reasonable approach in the context of, of what we're trying to achieve. And look, I suppose as a, as a broader comment and just something for you all to take on board, look, all economic models, including REM plan to some degree, are black boxes. You don't know absolutely everything that's gone on behind the scenes to generate these estimates. Our intent is to make um, our data sets as Sort of transparent and as open to scrutiny as possible, but we're not putting absolutely everything on the table. So I'd encourage you all to be uh, very sceptical and um, when it comes to well, any kind of economic modelling or, or analysis and, and just think about the degree to which what's being presented, is it in fact completely a black box? Do you have any capacity uh, to look at the assumptions behind the scenes and uh, and understand what sort of 
uh, compromises and, and assumptions have been uh, have been applied. Okay. Now, the aim of REMPLAN and these uh, input output area specific input output data sets is to is to have a, a make a contribution to and have an input to uh, obviously generating uh, detailed local data. Uh, a lot of our work involves providing this as a, an a input into economic development strategies. Now, an economic development strategy is essentially a blueprint for how a local economy is going to uh, be developed and change over time. And it's to highlight, uh, well, it's to highlight a whole range of things, but, but typically it looks at uh, a number of opportunities and then perhaps identifies a whole range of actions, often in relation to infrastructure, supporting infrastructure to support those, uh, those projected future opportunities. It can also be applied to look at what the local economy doesn't have. So just as we're identifying all of the local uh, industries and the output that's being generated, the demand for local goods and services, the, the capacity of the local economy to supply those goods and services, it can also be quite useful for identifying what a local economy doesn't have. So that construction sector, what not only what is it able to source locally, but what isn't it able to source locally? And by identifying those gaps, it's a starting point for identifying potential import replacement opportunities and, and anything that's currently being imported that possibly be replaced by local production represents a boost to uh, to regional output and value adding. Now the impact modeling in REMPLAN can also be used to uh, look at the, uh, the value of potential developments or industry closures. Um, it can be applied to look at the, uh, the type of contributions that existing firms or organizations make. For instance, you might be able to apply uh, um, an input output model to look at the contribution of Charles Darwin University's campus to the Darwin economy uh, given all of the uh, the academic and general staff that are employed what kind of uh, consumption benefits does that deliver what kind of goods and services uh, does the um, that does the campus's uh, operations generate. You might also look at the uh, at the student population, uh, particularly those that are coming to study from further afield, and you know all of their uh, all all of the consumption activity of all of those students would also make a, a sizable contribution to the uh, to the local economy. You can use all of this data to benchmark with other areas. So, so what do we have that other areas don't? Uh, and perhaps that provides some insights into what our comparative strengths and weaknesses are. You can add weight to feasibility studies and funding applications. Um, in terms of government agencies, you can also provide very timely uh, data to the media. So, for instance, there might be an announcement around a really large investment in the local economy, or hopefully not, but perhaps on the negative side of a of a business that's closing, and then what? And invariably, the media will then go to those uh, responsible uh, government agencies and say, you know, how 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 concerned are you for this, or what's the magnitude of the likely benefits stemming from this investment? And it enables those government agencies to be on the front foot to respond with some data that's readily at hand. Now, the other side, of course, is to, uh, is to uh, attract, uh, attract investment. Okay. Now, it's particularly in relation to this, um, into that line that's highlighted there, opportunities for import replacement and value adding. In REMPLAN, we refer to that as uh, gap analysis, and that's specifically what I'd really like to uh, talk about uh, today. Okay, so, so employment data is the basis for estimating local demand for goods and services and for assessing that, that capacity um, of the region's economy to supply a proportion of those goods and services locally. Um, now, this data, as 
previously alluded to, can also be applied to identify gaps in local supply chains. So areas where we don't currently have the capacity to supply those goods and services locally. And the idea is that those gaps highlight potential opportunities for, um, for growing the local economy through uh, import replacement and value adding. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of an economic uh, development strategy, um, yes, I, I suppose you should always be looking at those, uh, at those emerging opportunities, you know, things that are on the horizon, distant, distant horizon. But, but we, we always argue that you should also look at your existing stre strengths. What do you currently have and what kind of demand are those industries um, uh, generating in terms of those requirements for intermediate inputs, those, uh, those goods and services? Now, with the approach we take, we have a particular focus on uh, domestic imports. And, and look, I, I guess there's a, there's a rationale for this. Um, many of the goods and services that our industries import from overseas are priced at a level making uh, substitution with local uh, supply. Uh, look, look in, many, in many instances, unfe unlikely or unfeasible. Um, I mean, if you can produce something overseas and Put it on a put it on a ship or a plane and get it here, and it's still considerably cheaper than what we can produce locally. There are likely to be some fairly significant barriers for uh, for local industries. Now, imports from the rest of Australia, however, may indicate um, opportunities for local import replacement um, that are well. Look, they're they're currently feasible in Australia, and and and. Our thoughts are that they provide a guide to realistic and high value uh, opportunities to develop the local economy. So I suppose the rhetorical question is, look, if, it, if it's currently feasible to produce these goods and services somewhere else in Australia, then that rhetorical question is, well, why not here? Why isn't it feasible here? Now, we, we automate uh, a lot of these processes in, in REMPLAN, but I would like to take you through a practical exercise. Now, this is not specifically for assessment, but I, I think it would really help you in further understanding the input-output framework and the uh, and and the process of estimating gaps in uh, in local supply chains. Now, now step one here is uh, is build a, a 111 industry sector. Um, uh, input coefficients matrix for Darwin. Now, what we mean by that is within REMPLAN, I think we've previously had a look at the uh, the matrix or the or the regionalized input output table that's in the program. We've had a look at that uh, at the values that are there. When we're talking about coefficients, we're talking about setting the output of every industry. Uh, down to one dollar. So, look, in actual fact, it might be five hundred million dollars. Another sector might be a hundred million dollars. But we're scaling everything down to one dollar. And what we're doing uh, as part of that, everything else, so all of those goods and services that are that are sourced within the local economy or imported from overseas, they all get scaled down proportionately. And so, this enables us to say, for uh, for instance, for for um, for one industry, perhaps per dollar of output, uh, it spends, say for construction, it might be per dollar of output, it typically spends two cents on inputs from structural metal products within the local economy. Okay, now we might just uh, we might just cross over to uh, to Remplan now and have a look at that. Okay. So I'm already logged in here. So just to um, so once again, the the web address is uh, remplanlogin.com.au. I'm already logged in, and yes, you'll have access to data sets for Alice Springs, Darwin, and the Northern Territory. I've selected the uh, the uh, data set for Darwin. Let's have a look at the uh, the matrix. Now. 
When you go in, you'll see this at this uh, 19 industry sector level. It's again reading down the column, that's the demand side of the economy. Reading across the row, that's the supply side. Any cell that you click on, that right hand pane tracks along and provides an explanation of what that particular figure relates to. Which industry is doing the buying, reading down the column, and which industry is on the supply side, reading across the row. So if you don't remember, I guess, all of the details about that matrix, just refer to that right hand pane because it's just tracking along and providing that, uh, that commentary. Now I'm going to expand everything out to 111 industries. And I'll scroll down, right down to the bottom. And you can see here that, okay, what I'm now going to do is on the left hand side, I'm going to select input coefficients. So top left hand corner of the screen, input coefficients. So you can see the, the output, it's all the different levels of output that are being generated by local industries. All of that is going to be scaled down to $1. So let's select input coefficients. So scale right down. Okay, and so therefore you can see now that everything is as a percentage of that output that's being generated. Okay. So for instance, uh, let's say oil and gas extraction, for every one dollar of output we're estimating that uh, six cents or close to seven cents is spent on local goods and services. Whereas uh, processed seafood manufacturing, it's considerably higher at, for every one dollar, uh, close to 25 cents is spent on locally sourced goods and services. Now, all of that capacity to, or that ability to be able to purchase things locally, that local expenditure, depends on the capacity of all of these industries to supply. And so once again, all of that is underpinned by local employment data. Now all of that information there in the matrix, over on the left hand side of the screen, we can select uh, copy print all, it opens up into another screen. I'm just going to make sure that I have an Excel spreadsheet open. I might just open up another one here. Okay. So going back into this other window where the, where the matrix has come up, if you can run your mouse and highlight everything, but a bit of a shortcut is just holding down control, hitting A, that's just a shortcut for select all. Right click, copy, and over into the Excel spreadsheet, Control V to paste, and in it all goes. All of that data has been copied and pasted over. Okay, I'm just going to minimize that for the moment, close that screen. Okay. Now, the next step, I want you to, uh, as part of this exercise, is to, and as I said, I'll just reiterate, this is, not for, um, this is not for assessment, and in fact, all of this happens automatically within RenPlan, but I think if you go through these steps, you'll have a, a much more uh, comprehensive understanding of, uh, of the input-output framework, particularly the regionalization of the national data sets, and, but, and, I, and I think you will have a much more comprehensive understanding of, uh, of gap analysis by, by going through this process. So the next step is to build a input coefficient matrix for Australia. Now, I'm, I'm, in terms of uh, accessing that 
Australian input output table, we need to go to the ABS uh, website. Okay, and here we go. So abs.gov.au. The left hand side of the screen down to national accounts. Scroll down. There we go. National accounts, input output tables, electronic publication, that top link there. Downloads. And it's table eight. Industry by industry flow table, indirect allocation of imports. Okay. Now, the structure of this table is basically exactly the same as what you'll find in Remplan. Certainly the order of the, uh, the industry sectors is the same. And scrolling right down the bottom, see total intermediate use, that's what we call uh, local expenditure, compensation of employees, wages and salaries. Um, there's uh, complementary imports, that's what we call domestic imports and competing imports, which are imports from overseas, and total uses, that's what we, re we refer to as output. And that's a pretty important figure here, because what I want you to do is for that total uses or total output, I want you all to scale that down to $1, and then from there calculate uh, coefficients for each of these industries. So therefore we can say for any one of these industries, so whether it's sheep, grains, beef and dairy cattle, per dollar of output, if you scale that down to one dollar, per dollar of output, how much does that industry spend on inputs from water supply, sewerage and drainage services or whatever, whatever the industry might be. In fact we want those coefficients of course for every single industry. Okay. Once you've done that, what we're going to do for quadrant one, and just to reiterate, quadrant one is all of those buying and selling relationships between industries. I want you to take those national coefficients and from the national coefficients, subtract the coefficients for Darwin. Okay. So from these national coefficients, I want you to subtract these coefficients for Darwin, the ones that we just copied and pasted out of REMPLAN. The difference between, so once you've done that, what you'll effectively have is the difference between total demand for goods and services by local industries and the difference between that and the capacity of those industries to source those goods and services locally. So it's total demand for goods and services minus local supply and what's left are the gaps in local supply chains. Okay, Per dollar of output, what can't be sourced locally, what has to be brought in from outside, from other areas within the country. Now, what you then do is for each of those industries, I'm going to go back into REMPLAN now, apply those gaps, we go back to values, apply those coefficients, those gaps in local supply chains, and for each one, for each gap, multiply it by the value of local output. And that way, what you're doing effectively is taking those uh, those gaps in local supply chains expressed as you know, per dollar of output and you're scaling it up to the total value of output generated in the local economy and so you're now quantifying the value of those gaps. Okay. By doing so, you are identifying where the high value gaps are within local supply chains and Within all of those high value gaps, there may be opportunities 
to replace those with um, local production, thereby representing further value adding in the local economy. Now all of those steps are detailed here in this presentation. I'll just quickly go back to the previous slide. So step one. And then step two, so building those input coefficients for Australia. Step three. And then multiply the output. This is step four, multiply the output column total for each local industry by the gap coefficients. Of course, the ones that are greater than zero. Now, the next step, so once you've identified the value of all of those gaps in local supply chains, the next step is to collate, analyse and interpret all of those gaps. Now, the idea is that this is this is an approach for highlighting high value but also realistic potential opportunities for import replacement and value adding. Now, and this is where the interpretation comes in. The model will identify gaps which that might just be the reality of the Darwin or the Northern Territory economy. There's no way that those particular goods and services can be supplied locally. And that's where your uh, interpretation as practitioners comes in to basically sort out the difference between those gaps which, well, okay, you've identified a gap, but there's really nothing we can do about that as opposed to those gaps which actually do represent realistic opportunities to, uh, to boost economic activity in the local production, replace some of those gaps with local production, thereby increasing value adding and uh, gross regional product. Okay. Now, just to reiterate, all of that is automated uh, within RemPlan. And I'll just take you back into the into the RemPlan software now. So this is the, so we're still on the matrix on the matrix tab. We're looking at all of those buying and selling relationships between industries. In a way, gap analysis is the opposite or the inverse of that. So the matrix details the buying and selling relationships. The gap analysis module highlights those gaps in local supply chains. So I've opened up the gap analysis tab and we've got the domestic imports table selected. Now what the software is also doing, it's colour coding the higher value gaps. Now this is at a 19 industry sector level. Let's drill down into a bit more detail. So on the left hand side I'm going to expand that out. Okay. We can then use the legend below uh, to select all of those high value gaps in local supply chains. If you hold the control key down, you can select more. So I've selected the, uh, uh, the top two groups. And what the right hand pane is doing, it's automatically grabbing all of that information from the matrix and collating it here. And it's identifying those industries elsewhere in Australia that are supplying uh, goods and services to the following local industries in Darwin. So we can see a lot of imports of petroleum and coal products. And because of the way uh, refining activities, uh, given their concentration in a small number of locations around the country, there may, at this particular point in time, be somewhat uh, limited opportunities to replace that. However, of course, there are some <clears throat> there are some major uh, investments in uh, oil and gas in the area uh, underway, and, and in the future, a uh, substantial proportion of what's currently brought in from outside, if it's possible, maybe it will be replaced with local production. But look, we're also picking up quite high value gaps, not far shy of fifty million dollars in terms of finance, uh, selling into um, ownership of dwellings. So there's obviously a large residential sector in Darwin, but when we look what the model is saying, when we look at the level of employment in finance, it appears that a lot of that servicing is coming from outside of the area. 
appears to be some quite high value opportunities in relation to computer systems design and related services, particularly selling into government administration and uh, defence, some further finance opportunities, um, further opportunities for construction services into defence. So anyway, as a practitioner, it's about going through this and highlighting where there might be not only the high value opportunities, but also where there are some uh, realistic and practical opportunities to, uh, to grow the local economy. Okay. Now, what we've, what, what, I, what we've gone through today is probably one of the more involved applications um, of, uh, of REMPLAN. So once again, I'd encourage you to refer to the, uh, to the help files if you have uh, any um, sort of technical questions about this, I'm more than happy to, uh, uh, to field uh, any of those questions that you, uh, that you might have. Look, the, the next lecture will be, um, so, so I suppose in a way you could, you could think of gap analysis, and I'm just going to go back to the reports tab. Everything that we've covered today, in, in terms of the data sets that we've previously looked at, we've, we've considered uh, the total value of regional imports, I think uh, gap analysis really expands upon this story. It continues that narrative around, okay, well, well, not only what the total, the headline value of import, imports are, but it breaks it down and looks at what each industry sector is in fact bringing into the local economy. Now, the next lecture, we'll be looking at the workforce module. And what the workforce module does, it expands upon the employment reports in REMPLAN. So, once you've identified what the, um, what the key sectors of employment are, the next step, um, we believe, in terms of uh, planning for uh, an economy that's uh, sustainable and, and viable into the, into, the, you know, into the future, is to well, look at what your comparative strengths are, but also to see how sustainable those strengths are in terms of the workforce. How educated are the local workforce compared to uh, territory and national benchmarks? Or against benchmarks might also be other cities that um, that that you um, that the practitioner feels are, are worthwhile um, areas for comparison. Um, but it's not only about education and skills; it's about looking at the age profile of workers. If you have a key sector. And when we look at the age profile, if it, if it shows a relatively older workforce, well, uh, that might require some significant uh, training and education and perhaps skilled migration to ensure that those strengths continue uh, into the future. But it's also then about looking at um, uh, the intensity of the local uh, labour force. What are the hours people are working? Is there room for, for, for growth, for people to expand hours? Um, it's, uh, it's also about understanding where your local workers reside. So if there's an expanding mining sector, it might be interesting over time to look at where those workers reside. Are some people working in the area but, but flying in from outside? The opposite might be the case. We might be interested in, uh, in, in, in looking at uh, local residents who leave Darwin to work elsewhere and what industries they work in. But, uh, but anyway, we'll cover that uh, in more detail uh, in the next lecture. Thank you, and we'll uh, we'll speak soon.